I'm talking to my good friend, Klaus Kastberg, a draftsman, a designer, an unintentional artist. Through his beautiful elaborate drawings and study of some of life's artistic and philosophical enigmas, he's discovered some controversial findings, some of which turn current design and mathematical thinking on its head. Hello Klaus. Hello. Where were you born? In Denmark, Copenhagen, Denmark. Was that an interesting place to grow up? Very dis well, Disney-like country, except it was sort of more genuine. It, it was actually a fairy tale country in those days. And you saw that portrayed in the movies, for example, that they were made in those times. And Did yeah, you yeah. study design in high school, or was that later? Well, no, I left school when I was uh, actually one month before my 14th birthday. I did do a lot of reading. I actually started to read philosophy when I was very young. I actually started to uh, be very interested in Kierkegaard, San Kierkegaard, when I was 18 years old. And I was fascinated by the way that he uh, argued with other philosophers that, that, he, that at that time he lived in. And I was extremely impressed uh, when he talked about Descartes, or whatever his name is in English, Descartes, who said, um, uh, I think, therefore I am. Mm. And Kierkegaard said, the sentence <coughs> can easily be cut down <coughs> in half. I said, wow. He said, you don't need to say the last part. Say, I think. That's it. That is it. That's it. When, when did you first pick up the pencil and start drawing designs? That became much, much later. That was in my thirties. I saw an ad in the paper that you can join an interior architect school. And for some reason, I don't know why, I, I signed up for that. I loved the drawings we had to do. Right? And the geometric drawings as well which I really knew very, very little about in those days. Slowly I became better and better, of course, doing a lot of drawing. Necessity being the mother of invention. Yeah, absolutely true, yeah. I learned a lot about the Danish designers from the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, and got fascinated about their skills and, and their love of wood and love of using very exotic uh, timbers for, for the furniture. And My wife's parent was Danish. They immigrated to uh, Australia in 49, and that's where my wife was born. I think a month after they arrived. Uh, I met her first time in Australia, and when I was there from 69 to 72. But we then decided to go to Denmark and live there, and that's where I took the, the interior design course. Uh -huh. But uh, because we sent, we got received a lot of letters from my wife's parents wanting us to come back to Australia. So in the end, in 1975, we couldn't resist any longer, especially when they, when they uh, uh, offered to pay our trip back. We came straight from Copenhagen to Hobart in Tasmania. And of course I couldn't get a job, but I could get a job as a taxi driver. But uh, then of course I, I applied for a job in a, a quite modern furniture shop in Hobart called Pearson Interiors, where I worked for five years. And when did you move to Queensland? That was in the beginning of the 80s. And how did Probably you find yourself one. working in the film industry? Well, that came much later. You know, first I worked in various uh, architect companies or firms, you know, as just as a draftman more into precision drawings and, and what have you, which I also enjoyed. But one day I got a call from a friend of mine that said uh, that he's just uh, that worked at QUT in Brisbane, some person down at the movie studios in Oxenford, that they needed a draftman uh, if they knew anybody uh, at the QUT. And, and my friend said, no, I know another bloke that might be interested. And then he called me and said, yeah, I'm interested. And then I went down to talk to a, a 
a production designer, and uh, he just hired me there on the spot. He must have been desperate for somebody. <laughs> And that was the start of me working in the film industry for the next 17 years. Yeah. And so when did you start doing drawings uh, based on Philosopher's Stone, um, that, the Trivian Man? That actually started in the beginning of the ages, where I one day uh, had, found, had this compunction, if that's the word, to go into a second-hand bookstore. I can't remember where, but the strangest thing was that uh, I went straight over to a bookcase and looked. I don't know why I ever went straight over to this bookcase, but there was one book there. I took it out, it was just a little paper bag, and looked at it, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll read that. And then I went over to the counter and paid my two dollars or whatever, three dollars for this little paper bag. And what was the book? It was called uh, The Secret Power of Pyramids by Bill Schul and Ed Petit. Do you have it there? Yeah, I got it here. Mm. I read it and I found it very interesting actually. And that's the first time I ever thought about the pyramid, but inside the book was a drawing of the pyramid in, in Egypt, which is that one there. Save it. At that time, I worked in a furniture shop in Brisbane, and the owner there, Hans Boy, he decided to uh, also sell Persian carpets. So he opened up a little shop up at Curling Grove, where he sold Persian carpets, and he asked me to go out there and look after the shop. And sometimes there was not many customers, <laughs> but I still had the book there with me to read to finish reading it. But one day I started to, uh, without me actually knowing what I was doing, to draw a half circle around this drawing and try and measure it up, and did strange things with it. And I don't really know. No, I don't really think I knew what I was doing. And one day, uh, I had this uh, Eureka moment. I said, ah, I think I'm finding something here I never thought about in my life. And, and that was the start to my whole pyramid experience. I then went on for another 30 years. And you've since done these drawings of the pyramids? Yeah. It has been an incredible journey. You know, I knew I was onto something, but I didn't know what I was into. When you put the mm. semicircle over the mm. pyramids, mm. what did it show you? Well, through a few experimentations, I found that the side of the pyramid went down and divided the circle into seven equal parts. And that actually inspired me to, to, to keep on going because I don't think anybody has ever found that out, you know, ever. Um, so and then, of course, other things started to make sense. You say you've, you've found mm. the chamber within the, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. That came much later, yeah. One that hasn't been found even well, today. Exactly, I found the secret uh, a chamber beneath the pyramid that uh, Kay, what's the name? Casey uh, spoke about. Uh, so people have been talking about this of a long time, yeah. And through geometry and mathematics and, mm. and, and drawings, yeah. you, you believe you know exactly where it is? I know exactly where it is, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, let's, let's have yeah. a look at that drawing. Yeah. And then we'll... yeah, so this is the location of the secret chamber. Right, beneath the pyramid, in the center, that uh, it got Casey talked about. All points leading to, mm. to there. Which will be revealed in the future. But mankind is not ready for that yet. Too much evil in the world. The, the, this spot here, right, so 
That's on the top of that triangle in there. Uh -huh. You see that in there? And when we remove this overlay here, you will see that the chamber, the top of the chamber is in there. But this is actually the size of the missing capstone. That's the missing capstone as Giza stands in, in Egypt today. Which is exactly the same, the, the distance between the base on the ground and where Giza stands, or where the pyramid stands in Giza, right there, which is a dotted line, which very much had the size of the key queen's chamber, there. So the missing capstone is represented at the queen's chamber, between the underground uh, baseline and the overground baseline, but it's also where the secret chamber is located as you will see on this drawing here. There. So that's where that points to. The pentagon, the hexagon, and what's the seven-sided, and the octagon. So the five, six, seven, eight, gone. All right, they all point to this point, point there. And intersection. So all those lines has a, a a start and a finish. All of them. All. And of course, you have the square in there as well. In order to draw a pentagon, you simply divide the uh, the the diameter of a circle into units, right? So four units, but put put the compass leg on the first unit here, and then you draw a line up there, down to there to get B. In order to find the side of the pentagon, of the pentagon, you put the compass there, and from B up to where it meets the circle is the side of the pentagon. And you just repeat that. That's how you develop the pentagon. I found out to my delight that simply extending that line from V to A down to the here, you get the pyramid. Simply by extending that line to there, you now get the base of the pyramid. Nobody knows this. Within a perfect hexagon? Oh. With a perfect hexagon. Wow. It's fantastic. Well, I got all that uh, uh, clean, clean written. How long does it take you to do a drawing? Well, a drawing sort of develops. You start little, and you do enormous amount of of uh, trials and retrials. I learned very early on that. This here will always succeed if I'm extremely accurate. So lots of mistakes? A lot of mistakes, a lot of trials and errors. Because you want to find this uh, unit that, that repeats itself. Uh, that makes sense. This, this is actually very hard to talk about because... And not, not only do you claim to have found the hidden chamber, mm. but you believe that the pyramids is based on the meter? I found that out very quickly actually, uh, because the first pattern I ever saw, for some reason when I did my first circle, it turned out for me to be 308 uh, meters in diameter, which made the pyramid 154 meters high, for some reason I used diam the diameter uh, on the circle as the base for the pyramid, which means that the radius becomes the height of the pyramid. Right. 
So, using the diameter, the base became 246 meters, which is 123 plus 123. And the height became 154 meters, which is 2 times uh, 77. And then, of course, the apex of the pyramid became 77 and the seventh degree. And I like that. I like the 123 as ABC. Mm. And of course, I like the, the double 77. I like the number 77 because the, the side of the pyramid divided the circle into seven equal parts. So I like that, right? The diameter of the circle that is 308 meters in diameter. That attracted me a lot. And then, of course, I tried to base all my other calculations on those numbers, but I could never actually make them to harmonize with anything else. So I had to do a lot of different variations to that. And sometimes um, we're about to give up, you know, but always something happened to make me keep going. The difference between 308 and uh, 246, you divide that and see how you get a number, right? And in those days it was 1.59724 or something like that. 72, yeah, some repeated. So that's a proportion. And I tried to work out whether that proportion was was significant, whether it shined through other things. But of course I, I liked it because I learned so much about it. But it didn't quite gel. So you have to try again, right? Over and over and over. Later on I thought, ah, well, well, it can't really be 200, 246 meters. Don't forget, I always knew that, that measurement was below the surface where the pyramid stands in Giza. I knew that the pyramid, as it stands, is around 231 meters, as it stands on the, on, on the land, right? So also like that, I like the one, two, three, underground, and two, three, one, and two, three, one is three times seventy-seven. So it it felt nice, and it's all in meters. Right? But I never understood the significance of the meter. That came later on. And the meter, mm. as people will know, mm. was not really implemented until the French. Implemented in the late in 17, 1793, yeah. I think, that that Napoleon asked some of his savants to f measure the meridian of, of, of the circumference of the Earth, and I think they measured it from the equator up to the pole, and found that there was ten thousand meters, or they found a measure uh, 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 a unit there that then they subdivided into a, a, what is it called. A Yep. a ten thousandth of, of a unit, and call that a meter. But in right. itself, if the French weren't using it until mm. late 1700s, mm. pyramids were four, uh, four and a half thousand years ago. No, five thousand years, years, years ago. Yeah. You're suggesting then no. that they knew something way back. They didn't use the meter, but they used a unit called the Riemann which was exactly 37 centimeter, or 370 millimeter, right? And then they used another unit called the Royal Cubit, yeah. which was actually simply the Riemann multiplied by the square root of 2. So if you had a square where the sides are one Riemann, then diagonal becomes the Royal Cubit, simply. Just like, mm. if I can show you, like this here. Right, so that becomes the the, the Riemann, 370 millimeter, and that became the Royal Cubit, which is 524 kilo, uh, millimeter or thereabout, right? rounded off. So then I understood that they didn't have to know the meter, but maybe their Riemann at 370 centimeter was inspired, like. Napoleon's uh, servants maybe also were inspired, you know, given help from somewhere to make the meter the way it is today. So there's connection there. 
And then of course it turned out that 37 centimeter is an incredible spiritual number. But for example, your temperature in, in, in Celsius is comfortable 37 degrees. Below there you can die and above that you can die, you know, very quickly. Or at least you get very sick. But we're, ta we're talking about something that's as big as life itself here. Absolutely. Where numbers are obviously part of the DNA of human life. And, and it's the, the numbers actually uh, are incredibly important. You cannot perceive, for example, the infinite without actually putting numbers to it. It's impossible. You, know? you need the numbers in many, many, many aspects of life. But the numbers have to harmonize. You know? They really do. Which we see in nature. Which we see in nature. And then we can talk about the Fibonacci series and we can talk about... Talk about the what, The sorry? Fibonacci series, for example. What's right? that? Well, it says short. If you, if you take the number, series of numbers, so I stand for one, two, three, four, five, up, endlessly, then the Fibonacci series is simply to add the two preceding numbers together. For example, one and two is three, two and three is five, three and five is eight, uh, five and eight is thirteen, eight and thirteen is twenty-one, and so on and so on. That becomes the Fibonacci series. And, and the bigger, the bigger the numbers become, when you uh, divide two adjoining numbers together, you get a proportion which gets closer and closer to 1.618034. That's called the golden proportion, or the golden mean, or divine proportion. It's a very important proportion, right? Which is used in photography. It's, it's used everywhere. It's used in nature everywhere. It's used in, in the female or male and female form, and also the the, uh, the great artist in the world used uh, that proportion for the frame of their of their of their frames for the, for their canvases. You know, and, and what uh, we because it's it's the most pleasing, and and of course you make a rectangle. Say if one side is one, the other side is one point six one eight zero three four. See, right? So you get a you become you get a, a rectangle. That's very pleasing to the eye. So very harmonious rectangle. So that's been used uh, since antiquity, you know. Um, the Parthenon, for ah. example. And many other. Uh, monuments and cathedrals and I don't know what. So it's obvious that this isn't just an interest for you. It's uh, uh, this is going also go way back in time. Would you mm. say this is a, a passion? Well, it's, it's it's just to show that there's more to life than meets the eye. Much more. Is it a vocation? Is it something you feel? Yeah, it's, it, it becomes a bit, no, well, you can almost say it becomes an obsession. So intuitively knew that, that there must be a, a reason for all this. And it can only be done if I'm scrupulously honest and accurate. Otherwise I will never find what this is all about, you know. So. What about some of the obstacles you've come, you've come up against? Obviously, um, as you mentioned earlier, it takes mm. a long time to mm. uh, to make mistakes and oh yeah, a lot and and uncertainties and doubts and all that you have to to fight with and ah uh, uh, exhaustion and and you had a heart bypass a few years ago. Oh, there's nothing to do with that. No, that was something else. Did that affect your work? No, not at all. No. But just to go back to the measurements, I knew that I could not use, for example, 246 meters as the base length of the pyramid, so I tried with 246.4. Right. Why was the point four? Just to try to see what that did. So that means that I could not go. 
I could sort of sense that it improved things, but it still didn't gel. It actually improved the proportion that I was trying to find, right, the, the, the true proportion. But that didn't work either, through many tries and errors with that. So right. what did you try next? Then I was just about to give up. Right. I could not get it. I tried so many different things. Then one day, I was sitting there, something got into my mind and said, uh, why don't you try 246.42? And I said, nah, can't, can't be. Nah, nah. Why not? Nah, doesn't work. It's too, it's too many decimals, right? You just mark it up. Well, get rid of the comma, get rid of the uh, punctuation, just use 24642. All right, I'll try. Me acting with myself, right? And then, of course, I had to change the diameter, diameter, diameter of the circle to 308.025 meters. And then I had to change the side of the pyramid to 197.136 meters. And I thought, gee, I'm just making this worse. But then I found to my other delight that 246.42 meters is exactly 222 squared divided by 2. And then I find that uh, 308025 is exactly 555 squared. And then I found that 197.136 is exactly 444 squared. I said, wow. Then I got goosebumps and all sorts of things happened to me. And then of course it turned out that 246.42 is my birthday. Then, when I now knew that the base length of the pyramid underground was 246.42 meters, everything fell to place. Everything. It was just amazing. Then I found that I had a lot of collaborators. Previously, I had, for example, been interested in Leonardo da Vinci's uh, The Petrucian Man. You know, with the man stretch out the arms and so on. And I started to blow his image up where the circle became 308.025 meters. If I made uh, Leonardo da Vinci's square 246.42 meters, the corner of the square became less than. Leonardo da Vinci's, but met the circumference of the circle perfectly, spot on. So I now copied Leonardo da Vinci's uh, man, you know, traced him, and put it into my circle and square, and it is so beautiful. Then on da Vinci's drawing, da Vinci has put lines across up here, and around the chest and on the arms and on the legs. So when I used my grid, because I did find the grid there, based upon the Riemann or 37 uh, 
centimeters cubed at my particular grid, which also is based upon 37 degrees, right? All the lines in my drawing fitted your Navi Vincent's lines perfectly. So my drawing, the only difference between my drawing is simply that I reduced the square into meeting the circle and the square perfectly. And it became the same thing. Extremely fascinating stuff, you know. And then so almost following on from, from Leonardo's work. Totally, yeah. So Leonardo, of course, did not know what he was doing was drawing the Great Pyramid in Egypt. He just was, was studying Vitruvius and his measure of man. Then, of course, I discovered that uh, the circle that surrounds the pyramid in Egypt and the base of the pyramid itself underground is a true reflection of uh, the Da Vinci's Vitruvian man. And also his lines on the man's body, the really outstretched. Perfectly. Perfect. So that was a great, great discovery there. And then, of course, I tried again with uh, Michael Myers, uh, the Philosopher's Stone, uh, which is actually a very beautiful drawing. Also the circle, a triangle and a square, right? So I again drew that up and found to my utter amazement that the Philosopher's Stone is an absolute copy of the Vitruvian Man, the Vinci's Vitruvian Man. That the drawing that shows the Philosopher's Stone was done, was done by uh, Marquette Mayers in 1617. But he never managed to have the triangle touch the circle. It was that much short of, of the circle, right? But when I used the pyramid, then the top of the apex of a triangle and the circumference of a circle met perfectly as it did in Da Vinci's drawing. That's incredible. Totally fascinating stuff. Yeah. So actually what the pyramid is doing is uniting the circle and the square. Right? Uniting because they touch each other now. Uh, perfectly. So, so do you feel that the builders of the pyramid, the designers of the, of the pyramids, 5,000 years ago, were also would have inspired Michael Myers and Leonardo da Vinci. Then there was a third Further collaborator that came into the to the to the fray, which was a lady called Eliza Mylard. She worked with Le Corbusier when he did the modular, or he tried to find out the measure of a man himself, because he thought it was based on uh, again the, the golden mean. But he could not quite actually perfect his drawings to make sense. So he asked Eliza Mylard, a French mademoiselle, Eliza Mylard, I think her name is, to help him to come up with some drawings about his, that she, what she thought the, his uh, modular should look like. And again, I blew that up and found to my utter amazement, that, and now showing the drawing, right, that her drawing that consisted of four squares and no three squares and four circles turned out that her middle circle became exactly the same height as a pyramid. The two smaller circles in the in the in the center that's joined together, when you spread them apart, becomes the base links of the pyramid. And the last circle at the bottom she drew in, it, the diameter of that circle is exactly the length of the side of the pyramid. And I'm talking about exactly. There's no deviation. And don't forget, I was always very, very accurate. I did not accept just a 
tenths of a millimeter deviation or hundreds of a millimeter. No, I want it to be perfect. And it turned out to be amazing. So I have three collaborators there as well. This is, uh, this is the drawing that uh, Mademoiselle Eliza Maillard sent to Le Capuchier as her suggestion for the modular, right, consisting of uh, three squares and four circles. And that was the study of? Of man, the study of the measure of man, right, that he would use in his architecture. Now, when I copied that, I discovered to my utter delight that it turned out that the diameter of the top circle became the height of the pyramid and the two middle circles, the diameter of those two together constituted the base length of the pyramid and the large circle at the bottom constituted the side of the pyramid. The diameter of the large circle at the bottom is the same length as the, as the side of the pyramid. And I'm talking about totally accurate, spot on. So, the Mademoiselle Eliza Millard plays a very big role in, in this whole thing. And of course, she would have no idea that actually what she was drawing there was a great pyramid in Egypt. She must also have been inspired. Just amazing how absolutely perfect it fits together. And then, of course, there's uh, the fourth collaborator, Pete Hine, right? The most important of them all, really. <laughs> he needs to be talked about more. So, yeah. I think he was born in 1905. And in what way was his work collaborative? You have to read him. That's his super circle there. So we're looking at Pete Hines super circle. And his uh, equation. The super circle uh, can best be described as a form that unites the circle and the square. Which means that for example, if you draw a circle within a square and then start to cut off the corners of the square and increase the corners of the circle. Right, so if you to make, try to see that as a mental picture where slowly the corners of the square are rounded more and more, right? And the circle within the square the uh, arch that meets the corner of the square are increased more and more. Where those two meet, meet, another form appears where the circle and the square meet. And that's the one we call the super circle. So it's not really a square and it's not a circle. It's a new form which can, that both attract the circle and the square and can probably best be described as the neutral element or the child. The child that tries to unite two opposing forms or forces. And if we know that the circle is actually a, um, a symbol for the female and the square is a symbol for the man, we can now symbolically say that the super circle could be the child, right? but the super circle is more than that because it can also unite. And, and of course we could also say that uh, the circle is not only sim symbolic of the female, but also symbolic of the thought. And the square is not only sim symbolic of the male, but symbolic of of the uh, of the will. So the form you try to unite the thought and the will, but also uh, positive and negative, uh, for example. So as uh, well as an algebra. Uh, the negative and the positive, for example, or east and west, for example, because the Western world is 
basically male dominated in their building structures, you know, all square buildings. Where the east is more round, more mm. symbolic of the circle, you know, flowing garments and what have you, and more rounded houses. So it can also unite east and west, for example. <coughs> so it can be applied to many things, but also the super circle, the arch that comes out of it, or the curve, curvature that come out, is actually quite often found in the, the head of human beings, especially from the forehead up to the mm. top. It's the same kind of curvature, right? I can you can sort of see it when you when you know what you're when you for. know what you're looking for. Oh, yeah, oh, that's very close to the super circle's form. And how did the super circle work with Vitruvian man pyramids? Dot on the eye. Dot over the eye. Dot over the eye. So it was the final. Final. It was, it was the fantastic. Peace the resistance. He absolutely fantastic. Peace the resistance. Mm. He, yeah, absolutely fantastic. So, and you'd obviously been looking mm. at the super mm. circle for a while. Mm. But you from found the a correlation from, between from the beginning. Yeah. There's a correlation between all of these things. Yes. Of course. I was introduced to the super circle already in the beginning of the ages by a very good friend of mine who was a, a furniture designer. His name was Tom Brink Larsen and did some beautiful furnish for a, a company up in Brisbane called uh, Robert Dunlop. And Robert Dunlop was, uh, later on actually supplied furniture to the new Parliament House in Canberra. So he became very well known. But Tom wanted to find out how to, how to uh, draw the super circle geometrically. Uh, because Pete Hein was also a furniture designer and he made some uh, dining tables based upon the super circle and also the super eclipse which is more rectangular right, in form so and he was very successful he did some beautiful designs and and uh, sent out some brochures where he photographed his tables from above right. so Tom started to measure up and try, try to find out how to draw it geometrically and he became very, very close. He did some furniture himself based upon the super circle, but he didn't quite manage to draw it perfectly. So when I was introduced to the super circle through him, I wanted to make it perfect because that was now in my mind. What has to be achieved is to meet that curvature there with that curvature there perfectly didn't quite manage that, there was a little overlap right, where the two curvatures meet, couldn't get them absolutely accurate. So, and what did you find? I sort of took over, so I now started to do different ways of, of, uh, of uh, fun buying, uh, produce the two curvatures to a, a geometric grid. See, what Tom did was he took a, a circle and then he put a square in the circle and then a square in the square and another square in the other square and so on. But I did it differently. I took a circle and I squared the circle and I divided uh, the initial big circle into a smaller circle that was exactly a quarter the size of the big one. And try to experiment simply. because I thought to unite the circle and the square you must use a circle and a square of equal size right in in circumference slowly 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 I sort of became closer and closer and don't forget in order to get those two curvatures to meet exactly let's use a very fine pen pencil and be extremely accurate and that's probably why I actually, in the end, succeeded. Just this desire to be perfect. And as you can see, it turned out that to produce a super circle geometrically, of course, to my incredible astonishment, you have to use the pyramid in Egypt to produce it. 
another collaborator beyond my wildest dreams. And also based upon a grid that in the end turned out to be 37 centimeter grid, but also 37 degree diagonal lines. So again, 37 and 37. And were any, anybody else involved? Yes. Or was it just Leonardo da Vinci, and Pete Hine? Pete Hine and Michael Myers. No, and, and Le Corbusier, he was part of it too. You're in good company. Yeah, but I met two girls, installation artists, for some reason, in Brisbane, at some, state, some, state, uh, some time in the 80s, the 80s. And they were sort of, also into what is called sacred geometry. And one of the girls uh, said she had a, 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 not a book, but a magazine or called sacred geometry that she thought I should have a look at. Uh, I can just go and get it. Super circle, a super circle over there in the corner. And so this is a super ellipse. Yeah, Pete Hines super ellipse. Yeah. Super ellipse, and he he uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, his design was used in a. To, to uh, is it a, a Big Square or in, in Stockholm. Well, this is to show how the super circle harmonizes perfectly with the, the, the pyramid in Egypt. This is a super circle here and here. All right? And it is simply achieved by this square here, which is squaring of the circle to there and across and across. This circle here is a quarter of the large circle. In order to bring this curvature here, you put the compass on this point there to make the circle or the, the arch here and in order to make this curvature here you simply put the compass right where the circle and the square meet and that makes those two curvatures meet perfectly at this point here and equal points there which is, I think, 100 mil, 100 meters in scale. The distance from there to there is exactly 37 meters. There to there. And the angle here are 37 degrees to, uh, to uh, produce the grid. So this line there is where the pyramid stands on the uh, Giza Plateau today. And this distance from there to there is exactly a tenth of the, of the full height of the, of the uh, pyramid. But this distance here from there to there is exactly the height of the missing, uh, uh, the missing uh, uh, 
a capstone on the pyramid. So, the girls that you met in Brisbane, um, I met two girls, both of them are installation artists, they have, you know, done some beautiful work. And then I went over to her studio to see some of her work over there, and she lent it to me. And, of course, I read it. It was The Safe Journey by Robert Lawler. Very interesting book, actually. As I came to the last page in the book, I came across this photo here, mm -hmm. which shows the atom or, or a particle um, uh, in last one million times. And, but it's not really a photo of the particle itself. It's only a refraction photo, because the particles are too small. Even in last one million times, cannot capture them. So it's just the pattern that the particles sends out that they capture, right? And they say here that these refraction photos are the closest visualization that science can give with respect to the nature of atomic substance. This appears to be patterns of geometrized light energy. For some reason, a couple of years prior to that, I had done a sketch. No idea what I was doing, just playing around with the super circle and the pyramid. And this is the sketch I'll just show you now. Very similar. One day I had this book lying on my desk and for some reason that my little drawing here was lying on top of some other stuff and just out of fun I took my drawing and overlaid it on this one here and to my utter surprise that was the result it's a perfect match so this is a super circle and the pyramid in four directions and I had no idea why I put in those circles in, in, in the cross section. Why I did that, do not ask me. I have no idea why I did that. Incredible. And then a couple of years later, two girls gave me a book where this... To make sense of it. Uh, to make sense of it. So even the pyramid and the super circle is a true representation of a refraction of an atom or particle. Again, reinforcing, reinforcing the the, uh, the, the the geometry and nature and yes. And then, sometimes later, I go into a bookshop somewhere, and there's a, a little uh, case with a lot of uh, national na national geographic magazines in. All right. And I just go up and pick one out, and that's from 1977, National Geographic. And what was I find in there? The exactly the same photo, but explaining in more details how they came about the photo. I think I got it out there. So let's go and take it. Oh, here's the one. Here it is. And just casually look through it. What's this about? And then I see on this page here the same refraction photo. But now in more detail explains what how they do it. It's a, a rhodidium atoms, yak yak yak, but they use a field iron microscope. So mm. there's a nice explanation here how they did the photography. But uh, this is the result. And here you see the pyramids and the super circle exactly, almost exactly, but very close. And during your um, mm. journey, what have you found out about pi? Which you would have had to try to use yeah. in some of your drawings, I would imagine. Yeah. The only thing that ever, ever made any sense was 
when I made pi into 22 over 7. Any other pi simply made no sense whatsoever. But of course the pi we now have in our calculators today is totally man-made. There's no spirituality about that. And the way it's actually formulated makes no sense. Because it's simply dividing the circle into infinite uh, radiuses. And of course later on we discovered that the circle cannot be bisected. It's impossibility. The circle is what it is. You know, the circle cannot consist of infinite facets, because then it's no longer a circle. So therefore the true pi is actually 22 or 7, which the pyramid in Egypt uh, indicates. What does that come out in decimal? Well, that's 3, three and 1 7. So 3 and 7 and 1 7 is proportion between the diameter and the circumference of a circle. It's not as it says in, in the calculator. That's a man-made pi and of course it makes no sense whatsoever. Because it does turn out, as I later on have shown, that you can actually make a circle. Uh, no, the, the, uh, the area of a circle corresponds absolutely totally with a square or a triangle or a rectangle or the pyramid. You know, to make the area exactly the same, which I have shown. So, in that sense, it can easily be proven that the true pi is actually 22 over 7. Actually, it must be understood that the circle is simply a representation of a curve or a, uh, an arch, which again are representations of any wavelengths or oscillation or vibration or pulsation. That's what a circle is. You know, and that's why you can never, ever, ever have a point on the curvature. It cannot happen. So you cannot use points in order to determine a circle's uh, area or volume or what have you. You cannot use uh, uh, the old pi. You must use the true pi, the spiritual pi, which is 22 over 7. Uh, because the, cur the, the circle is simply a representation of uh, music. That's all it is. And you cannot make music if you can short circuit things on its curvature. Right. You cannot have a radio with many different frequencies that all play different music if you have points in there where wavelengths can meet and short circuit the whole system. They actually work together. Absolutely. Really you work. must in, in one point you have to have free space where an unknown amount of vibrations or frequencies can meet and bypass each other on different frequencies as you say. You cannot have a, a point in a circle. So if you're drawing a, a straight line mm. within a circle, it, it can can't. never truly touch. Can't. And don't forget there does not exist one, square, one straight line in the universe. It doesn't exist. If you had a line, it would be composed of particles, which are all curvatures. Wavelengths. Wavelengths. So if you ever find a straight line, blow it up and you will see it's filled with funny cracks. You can't have a straight line. That's an abstraction, you know. You can only have a, a straight line as an abstraction. So that's why I came up with a new, uh, a new uh, uh, axiom, where I say that the intersection of two curves can never create a point. Only when two straight lines intersect can a point occur. Right? And that really has to be thought about deeply, right? You can only have a point with two straight lines and that's of course, you do that in drawings and in architecture and, and in geometry and whatever, as a help. But even straight lines are questionable. They still have to be imagined. Yeah. Right? So, so, but two curvatures can never create a point. And that is why 
the, cal the, uh, the pi in calculator is uh, in error. Because they didn't think about those, that when mathematicians try to develop their own pi. Right? So if you want to use a true pi, <coughs> just use 22 over 7. Then your drawings will become absolutely accurate. Yeah. So what does it all mean? It means that we are spiritual human beings. <laughs> we are not physical. Of course we are, mm -hmm. but that dies away. But our soul, our higher selves, our thought and will are not subject to uh, the physicality of things. They exist in a highly higher dimension, uh, where death does not exist. I mean, you cannot kill a, 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 a thought, impossibility. You cannot kill the will. You cannot kill memories. You cannot kill uh, talents, abilities, skills. Of course not. The physical body dies. The soul, it means our higher selves, with the thought and the will, with all our talents, all our learned things, live on, but in a higher dimension, in the fourth dimension. But there exists no human being in this world that can kill life. No. Don't smarten yourself, don't forget that you can kill life. When you kill yourself, you only kill your body, you do not kill yourself cannot happen. So Klaus, you're, you're 72. What's your daily routine? Do you still draw? Uh, yeah, I still uh, would like to uh, draw more. Are you still refining early drawings? No, no. Uh, they are sort of just kept as, as, as drafts or, or to, to show the, 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 the struggle, you know, you have to go through in order to, to reach the goal, which is that things make sense. And what does the future hold? Uh, New drawings? No. An exhibition? Could be, if people would be interested. Are people ready for what you're proposing? I, I think it belongs to the future, but we can give it a try to see whether it's receptible to some people in today's world. This is actually in a troubled world we live in, because there's too much killing and, and darkness in this world today. So whether mankind is ready for proof of an afterlife or proof of a better world, uh, who knows? But we could give it a try. Eh? Society spends a lot of time on hedonistic pursuits these days. They do. Do you think they've forgotten about the important studies of the early philosophers and yeah, absolutely. artists? Absolutely. Consumerism has actually killed uh, the human spirit to quite a great degree. You know, a dumping down of the of, of human spirit is happening as we speak. You know, look at the news, for example, how dumb that is. The politicians have no idea who they are or what they're doing, none whatsoever. It's insane what's going on. Do you think by going away from um, the, the light mm, that, uh, and I say that not in too much of a spiritual meaning, but going away from the light as far mm. as uh, the, 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 the true... The truth and goodness, yeah. It, 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 it destroys man. It doesn't destroy it, but it, it debases mankind. We're going to a, a physical world that is so unrealistic, just an illusion. What they've been told by so-called educators or people who think they can be in charge of the human soul. You know, it's shocking actually. What do you want people to take from your drawings? To become individuals, thinking. Think outside the box, you know, become individuals, become personalities, become human beings, basically. Become uh, human. Klaus Kasberg, thank you for your time. I thank you.